Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure today to have Pavel uh, Munef. Am I right at pronouncing your last name correctly? Uh, pretty much it's, it's, well, it's, it's Munef, really. Munef, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pavel Munef. Uh, yeah. And he's going to speak about churn Simon theory on cylinders and generalized Hamilton Jacobi actions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So th thank you so much for inviting me to speak here. And uh, just a um, little uh, disclaimer. So, well, first of all, uh, I apologize. There will be no no arithmetic geometry in in, the, in this talk uh, at all. So it, there will be maybe a little bit of symplectic geometry. So, and the second disclaimer is that all well, this talk will necessarily be quite rough around the edges. Around the edges. So this is kind of a new story for me to try to explain publicly. So there are these exercises like when you're given pictures to make a story out of the pictures by laying in them in the correct order. So I'm not sure that I did this exercise correctly, but, but we'll see. Uh, so this is um, based on a joint work with Alberto Catania and Constantin Vernli, and there are um, two texts upcoming very soon and uh, focusing on the classical and quantum sides of the, of the story. Um, and this is a spin-off of some activity which is called BVBFV uh, program, and I will mention this. Um, so, what are we doing? So, uh, we want to look at um, well gauge theory um, or particular particular topological gauge theories really uh, on uh, on a Mm, on a cylinder on a, some manifold cross an interval and put some polarization at the initial time. So kind of a family of boundary conditions and some family of boundary conditions at a final time. And uh, calculate the uh, kind of the perturbative path integral of, for, for this uh, theory, uh, producing the action depending on the initial and boundary conditions and possibly on some residual fields that we don't integrate out. So then, well, the result of this computation can be interpreted in different ways. So for instance, if there are no residual fields to, that we don't integrate uh, out, uh, then it can be interpreted as a, a Siegel-Bargman transform or a version of a Siegel-Bargman transform. So uh, some kind of operator which compares for you the space of states presented in one polarization with the space of states presented in a different polarization. And um, I should say, uh, yeah, so there will be kind of a connection of this kind of quantum computation with a uh, classical story about um, Hamilton Jacobi actions and generalized generalized Hamilton Jacobi actions, which is the counterpart for systems with constraints. And um, the motivation uh, or one of the big motivations for this story will be an example, which I will mention very briefly in the end and briefly because, well, frankly, it's, it's a complicated example for me. So I, I don't think that I understand it well enough. It's a seven dimensional abelian churn Simons with, partic with a particular choice of boundary conditions. And uh, the motiv we, are, we are very much motivated by a paper from 2004 uh, by Gerasimov and Shitashvili. Um, and uh, yeah, so there was a connection of, of this uh, 7D abelian churn Simons with this choice of polarization with uh, something called Kudaira Spencer theory, which is also called BCOV theory or Bershatsky Chukoti Oguri Wafa. So this uh, six dimensional theory. But a toy model for this relation is churn Simons to WZW, which I will tell about in this context. Um, okay. So uh, now let me uh, kind of plunge into the very simple part, the classical part. So first of all, a reminder. So the Hamilton Jacobi actions are something we learn about from the textbooks on classical mechanics. So uh, if you start with a uh, first order classical mechanics, so with the action PDQ minus some Hamiltonian times DT, then you can uh, define, well, so here, um, yeah, so P and Q are coordinates on the phase space. Let's say it's a cotangent bundle for simplicity of, of Rn. So you can, um, uh, then you have the equations of motion uh, induced from the minimal action principle. And well, here they're just the Hamilton's equations and solving them. Well, let's say that the space of solutions, uh, let me denote it El, this is just some um, 
subspace in the path space. Oops, it randomly switches to the eraser. Subspace in the path space. And uh, if I evaluate uh, each of those kind of classically admissible paths at the initial point and at the final point, I get a sub manifold in the product of the initial copy of the phase space times final copy of the phase space. And let me denote this uh, well image uh, in this product by L. So th this is a copy of, sorry, this is a um, set of uh, kind of quadruples, initial coordinate and momentum and final coordinate and momentum such that they can connect them by classical trajectory. So this is a Lagrangian submanifold in the product of the initial and uh, phase space and final phase space. So then uh, what does Hamilton Jacobi action do? So there are two things about it. One, one is what, it's, uh, what it wants to do and the other is the construction for it. So what it wants to do is that it wants to generate this evolution relation or this Lagrangian uh, submanifold as a graph, uh, as a graph over Mm, uh, over the space of initial coordinates and final coordinates. So I can present my product of phase spaces as a cotangent bundle over initial coordinates and final coordinates. So I want a function of initial and final coordinates such that the graph of the differential of this function is my L evolution relation. So that's what I want to do. If I find such a function, then I call it the hamilton jacobi action or uh, or the gen generating function for the Lagrangian. So then I would have uh, that uh, kind of this way to describe uh, to describe the, um, the Lagrangian that well, uh, initial and final coordinates are arbitrary, but the moment I can recover from the hamilton jacobi action. So that's what, uh, what uh, hamilton jacobi action wants to do, but how to construct it. Uh, so is, uh, is is this idea that I, I should take the initial, uh, my original classical action and just um, evaluate it on a classical trajectory connecting the initial uh, coordinate and final coordinate, hoping that uh, the solution exists and is unique. So uh, if there is problem with existence and uniqueness, well, then there's a problem with this construction. So maybe maybe this uh, hamilton jacobi is multi-valued or uh, explodes sometimes or, or it doesn't exist sometimes, but th that is that is the idea at least. So that's the, the classical construction. There's a lemma that if I do this, then it's indeed the generating function for the evolution relation. And this is a, a, a way to phrase the hamilton jacobi equation. So now uh, a version for a constraint system uh, is the following. So here, let me maybe do it in, a, in an example. Uh, Kind of class of examples. So uh, here uh, I want to see, well, in this example, it will be a system without dynamics, but with constraints. So first class constraints and actually particularly simple ones. So the action is again, a one dimensional system. So uh, action is PDQ minus some new field, Lagrange multiplier field uh, paired with uh, some, okay, H, so what is H? So I want to have first class constraints and in the um, simplest situation is, is when they assemble into a, an equivalent moment map from the, from the phase space to the dual of some Lie algebra. And the simple situation is when this is an equivalent moment map corresponding to a Hamiltonian group action on the phase space. Uh, then, well, um, okay. Um, uh, the, so I have a, my old fields here and a new Lagrange multiplier field E, which I can think of as, well, a connection on an interval uh, in a trivial principle bundle in, uh, on the interval. So um, the equations of motion here are just, uh, well, um, the equations that tell me how uh, Q and P are, are evolving and the equation uh, uh, telling that uh, I should be on the zero uh, in the zero of the equivalent moment map. And the picture is that, well, uh, I have some, my, my face space, I have the uh, zero level set of the moment map, uh, which is a quasi-tropic submanifold. Uh, inside it, I have, well, on it, I have a characteristic distribution as on a quasi-tropic. 
And in fact, the leaves of the characteristic distribution are just orbits of the, of the group action. And my evolution equations just tell me that my evolution is just an arbitrary uh, path uh, in a single G orbit. That's what my evolution equations tell me. So, um, okay. Now, uh, let's say that I want to um, think about, um, about the hamilton jacobi action and what it means in this case. So I want to uh, put uh, the boundary conditions fixing the initial coordinate and final, let me fix final momentum rather than the initial coordinate uh, here. So, um, well, because fixing both initial coordinate and final coordinate is a little bit singular if you don't have um, an evolution in the game. So uh, here I need to do some uh, adjustment to my action. I need to add a, a boundary term to it, uh, adjusting for a change of polarization at this endpoint from, uh, from fixing Q to fixing P. And what this boundary term does, um, well, essentially it is adjusted in such a way that uh, solutions of uh, or your Lagrange equations are, they wouldn't be critical points of S, but they are critical points, sorry. Yeah, but they are critical points of this S adjusted. So uh, that's, that's the role of this boundary term. In other words, if I uh, calculate the variation of, the, of this S adjusted, then, uh, well, the boundary term of the variation is, con contains this delta Q at the initial time, which is, uh, zero if my Q initial is fixed and delta P at the final time, which is also zero if P final is fixed. So I added this term so, so as to have delta P at the final time rather than delta Q. So it's a variational calculus uh, trick, if you like, plus a term that, va that vanishes on the oil Lagrange equations. Anyway, so uh, the moral here is that if you change uh, your preferred polarization, you should accompany it by a change uh, by, by a boundary term for the action. So here I want to do certain construction and then I, I want to do what this construction does. So the construction is the following. So this is the construction. Uh, I want to uh, evaluate this action with a boundary term on uh, paths, uh, kind of P and Q depending on, uh, on time, uh, which uh, such that Q at the initial time is Q initial, P at the final time is P final, uh, so that they satisfy the first pair of equations. So the so-called evolution equations, those that involve the, that tell me something about the derivatives in time. So I single, I, I set them apart from, from the last equation, which I, which is the constraint. So I, I ignore the constraint and only solve the evolution equations. Uh, fixing uh, the Lagrange multiplier field E to be something. So the result is uh, some functional of the boundary conditions and this Lagrange multiplier field. And it turns out that it only depends on one invariant that I can compute out of the Lagrange multiplier field, namely, namely it's kind of parallel transport of, of the Lagrange multiplier field seen as a connection on the interval. So let me call this uh, holonomy or parallel transport, let me call it G. So I have constructed some object here, right? By evaluating the original action or adjusted by a boundary term on the solutions of the evolution equations, this pair of equations. So it depends on this additional parameter. So it, it turns out that this construction does something. It is a generalized generating function for the evolution Lagrangian. I still have the notion of, a of an evolution Lagrangian here, exactly the same as before. So I just take all solutions of all equations of motion, including the constraints and restrict them to initial time and final time. It is still a Lagrangian. Uh, it's not projectable to the, uh, it's not a graph of some map from the initial uh, phase space to the final phase space. It's not a graph in that sense anymore because this is a theory with constraints. But it's still a Lagrangian. And I can describe it as a, as a by this generalized generating function in the following way. So here maybe, maybe we should look 
and maybe we should look here at this description. Uh, so at this description, so I'm, I'm having my uh, generating function, which depends on uh, initial coordinates, final momenta and some auxiliary fields. So its graph is uh, lives in the graph of its, of, of its uh, differential lives in the cotangent bundle of the space. Then I want to do a very simple symplectic geometric construction. I want to intersect this graph, which is of course Lagrangian submanifold with a very simple quasitropic, which is a, a zero section here in the T star of the auxiliary variables intersected with the zero section there, and then do the quasitropic reduction, which is tantamount to, ju to just uh, projecting to the first two factors. So do the quasitropic reduction. In formulas, it, it is this. So, uh, it, ah, and I, uh, what I'm saying is that by this construction, what I get after the reduction, so taking my graph, uh, intersecting it with the, with the quasitropic and projecting, uh, what I get is, is the evolution relation sitting here. So in formulas, uh, this is what it means that I can recover my evolution relation by saying that uh, uh, initial momenta are the derivatives of my function with respect to initial coordinates. Here, well, actually I should interchange coordinates and momenta, sorry. Q out is the derivative, and put a minus here. Uh, Q out is the derivative of my function with respect to P out. And then uh, also I have this relation which imposes for me the constraint which corresponds to intersect to doing the intersection with the quasitropic, with the quasitropic here. So intersection with the quasitropic imposes the constraint for me. So uh, the uh, lemma here is that uh, the construction above gives me a generalized generating function for the evolution relation. I don't have a, a generating function in the usual sense, but I have a generalized one. So uh, evaluating the um, original action on the solutions to the evolution equations, ignoring the constraint, gives me the generalized generating function for the evolution Lagrangian. So that's, uh, that's the statement. Now, some examples. First of all, some examples without constraints. Uh, well, if I have a uh, just, well, simplest example, PDQ theory, if I do it in a Q to P polarization, then, okay, the um, uh, um, solutions to Lagrange equations are just constant paths. So including the appropriate correction for the polarization, here's the hamilton jacobi action. And if I want to uh, do the kind of same polarization on both ends, actually here, I already need my generalized hamilton jacobi functions because uh, here I cannot find uh, a solution of the equations of motion for generic uh, Q in and Q out because well, if they are different then there will be no solution. And if they are the same, there will be infinitely many solutions. However, I can find a generalized hamilton jacobi function and I do this by doing a partial Legendre transform by uh, so uh, I do the following, I rename my, so I, I, I want to change the momentum here to the coordinate. So I um, rename my P out here to some auxiliary variable beta. And then I compensate for the term with which I changed here. So I compensate for it. So the result will depend on initial coordinate, final coordinate, and this auxiliary variable beta. And this is in fact a generalized Hamilton Jacobi function for for the Lagrangian. So uh, and I can also include some evolution in the game. For instance, I can do I don't know, harmonic oscillator, for instance. Then, well, a little mm, computation uh, that I don't know, Mathematica can, can do for you uh, is that if you fix a initial coordinate final momentum, you, well, you need to find a uh, solution to the equations of motion uh, and evaluate the action there, it will be some quadratic expression in terms of the data, uh, initial coordinate and final momentum. And well, sometimes it explodes for, for depending on the time that has passed between these two moments. But well, here, here's the answer. And it explodes when there's a problem with existence and uniqueness. And if you have the same coordinates, uh, same polarization, uh, coordinates to uh, coordinates, 
Uh, then I do again the spatial Legendre transform. But here, actually, I can, um, I can do a full Legendre transform. So I can find the critical value of uh, my auxiliary variable beta and specialize to this critical value. And that's what I get then. And then this new expression also explodes at some different values of, of the time that has passed. And that's, again, uh, situations when uh, kind of this problem has um, issues with existing and uniqueness. Okay, so uh, now, uh, sorry, this is slightly messy. Uh, uh, abelian churn Simons on a, on a cylinder from the classical standpoint. So abelian churn Simons as defined by the action one half ADA, where A is a one form on a three manifold. So here my three manifold is a cylinder. Uh, the interval across the surface. So, and the surface is equipped with a complex structure. So I want to impose the boundary conditions being given by fixing a zero one component at the in boundary and one zero component at the out boundary. So, well, uh, writing my uh, one form, uh, splitting it in, into components. So AI is the kind of components containing DT going along the interval and the two others kind of uh, not containing DT, but sort of one zero and zero one uh, forms on the surface, depending on uh, on uh, on T. Uh, so this is how I can rewrite my action. So well, plus some appropriate boundary contribution, adjusting for the polarizations. So this is essentially PDQ theory. You can recognize it here: uh, a Lagrange multiplier and some constraint. So uh, you can find the evolution relations here. The uh, evolution um, relation is just, okay, pairs of initial one form and the final one form. So one form on the initial surface, one form on the final surface, uh, such that they're both closed and related by, by an exact one form. So the difference is exact. But well, finding a generating function is more tricky because, well, you're finding them in terms of a particular polarization. So giving a generating function is more tricky than describing the relation itself. So, uh, but you just calculate it uh, as, as for kind of this PDQ with constraints example before. And uh, this is what you get. This is what you get. So uh, it is, um, so you are evaluating uh, the abelian chen simons action uh, on the solutions of the evolution equations subject to the boundary conditions. And uh, the result will depend on the integral of this Lagrange multiplier field from, uh, well, in time al along the interval. So this is uh, kind of a, an auxiliary uh, object, a sigma, which is a function on, uh, a function on the surface. So this is uh, the result of this little computation. And while this result might look suggestive, for instance, um, I don't know, so in this piece, one can recognize um, uh, the free scalar field. And uh, here one can say that it's a free scalar field which interacts with, with the two boundary fields in some, in some particular way. So, um, all right. And then uh, one can also um, do the kind of the exercise transitioning to the uh, to the changing the polarization to the one zero polarization on the in boundary and retaining the still one zero polarization on the out boundary. This is done again by this Legendre transform trick uh, on the in boundary, and uh, after some convenient um, change of the uh, um, change of variables for the uh, for the auxiliary fields, that is what you find. So this is what you find where the auxiliary fields now are this sigma as before, which is a zero form on the surface and lambda, which is a zero one form on the surface. And again, this is a gener uh, generalized generating function for the, uh, for the um, evolution relation. So, um, well, uh, yeah, so again, so these, these formulas seem to be more tricky than the uh, Lagrangian relation that we are describing, but well, and they involve the complex structure, but well, this, this is how it is. So, because we are trying to 
uh, present it as a graph in terms of some polarization, which does use the data of the complex structure. Okay. Now, um, okay, so now we are transitioning to the quantum side. So any questions so far? So, um, well, here I, I need to just, I want to keep it uh, sh uh, short, the, the, uh, this part. So there is a kind of a program, which is called the BV BFE program. And uh, BV stands for Battalion Wilkowski and BFE stands for Battalion Fratkin Wilkowski. And uh, BV is a point of view as a uh, kind of, it's a, enhancement of BRST formalism for gauge theories and uh, BFV is its Hamiltonian version. And uh, so BV, BFV formalism is something that we uh, thought about with my co-authors, Alberto Catania and Nikolai Reshetichin. And uh, this is um, uh, essentially the, the idea is to put together Patel and Wilkowski formalism with the idea of um, cutting, cutting and gluing a la, a la T and Siegel. So, and this is just some point of view on uh, gauge theories and well, you can adopt it. Um, and um, just look at gauge theories through this prism. So um, classically speaking, an n-dimensional BVBFE theory is assigning to an n minus one dimensional closed manifold, some super geometric package. So it will be a phase space, which will be a differential graded manifold. So equipped to some cohomological vector field, some symplectic form, which well, is exact or more generally, more generally not exact, but uh, given by curvature of a pre-quantum line bundle. Uh, and uh, also one needs a uh, degree one action. So degree means uh, Ghost degree, and uh, which is a Hamiltonian for the homological vector field here. So, and to a bulk manifold, to an n-dimensional manifold, one also attaches some um, some kind of package of supergeometric data. It's again a DG manifold, differential graded manifold with an odd symplectic structure, which is a BV2 form, and an action uh, S. So, and then there are kind of some relations. Well, as I said, for well, the uh, vector fields, they're cohomological, so they square to zero. Uh, so on the boundary, S is the Hamiltonian for Q. And in the bulk, well, if there were no boundary, then S would have been a Hamiltonian for Q with respect to the PV2 form. But in the presence of boundary, this is broken by a boundary term. We, and this, uh, how it is broken is it's measured by this one form on the boundary. So this is kind of the main structure relation that kind of connects the bulk and the boundary. On the quantum side, um, the a piece of boundary is uh, is assigned a co-chain complex where the differential is the quantum BRST operator. And a bulk manifold is assigned uh, two things, the space of residual fields or zero mode, if you like, which is an odd symplectic manifold. So it carries an odd symplectic structure and the partition function, which is a, an element in the space of states attached to the boundary tensor with functions of residual fields. So more precisely half densities, more precisely half densities of residual fields. And then there are relations here. Well, the object here is a differential. And uh, another kind of a bulk relation is that uh, there's a certain uh, differential that annihilates the partition function. And this uh, differential is a combination of two things. It's a, a second order differential operator acting on residual fields, the so-called BV Laplacian, a canonical second order differential operator, odd uh, uh, differential operator acting on, um, uh, well, half densities on a not symplectic manifold. And, um, and the boundary contribution, which is precisely this BRST operator. So for instance, if there are no residual fields, then this is just the condition that the partition function is closed under the boundary BRST operator. On the other hand, if there is no boundary, then this is the standard so-called uh, quantum master equation. But by some abuse of language, this is also called quantum master equation. So, and the idea of um, quantization here is that, well, on the boundary, we need to fix a polarization uh, of the phase space, a Lagrangian polarization. 
well, for instance, real fibrating polarization with base, uh, let, let's call it B, B curly, uh, such that um, the fibers, uh, such that alpha, this one form alpha, one form alpha is vanishing on the fibers. That's, oops, uh, a simplifying assumption. Simplifying assumption, alpha is vanishing on the fibers. Then uh, the space of states is just, well, functions or more precisely half densities on the base. And uh, the BRST, quantum BRST operator is just uh, the uh, quantization of, the, uh, of this BFV action uh, on the phase space, well, with some choice of ordering such that, uh, such that it squares to zero. And the quantization in the bulk is like that. So you have uh, your, this is just a very, very rough sketch Then you need to actually make, make it precise in, in examples or make sense of it. But that's just a rough, rough idea. So, uh, this, so the space of fields is fibered over the, the phase space by the projection, which was part of the data about which I should have, <laughs> should have told. But the idea is that pulling back, pulling back the fields to the boundary. So that's the idea of this projection. So you can pull back fields to the boundary and then use your Lagrangian polarization and go to the, to the corresponding leaf. Uh, so you have this kind of two uh, vibrations going on and then choosing an element in this base of the Lagrangian polarization, a uh, little b, then you have uh, a Lagrangian leaf in the phase space and this, in the space of fields you have uh, all fields uh, with the boundary condition given by that Lagrangian. And well, let's say that those are the fields F sub, uh, F sub B, so fields corresponding to a particular boundary condition. And under some niceness assumptions, they all look like some universal space Y, so they are translates of some universal space Y. And well, let's say we have linear structure on F, uh, then, well, again, uh, let's under, assuming that there are some splittings, uh, the space of fields is, can be presented as a product of the, uh, of the base times this universal fiber. Then naively, uh, the partition function would be an integral over, uh, over the fiber of the exponential affection, depending parametrically on a point in the base. On the boundary condition. Well, here are, there are two uh, two amendments. One is that <clears throat> it should be an integral over. Uh, one is that I would like to retain some subspace here over which I would rather not integrate and only integrate over the complement. The part that I don't integrate, I call residual fields or zero modes. And those are, in some sense, abstractions for the perturbative integration, or well, cohomologies in some example in set of examples. That's one amendment. And the other one is that in Y prime, when I integrate, actually I should integrate over a Lagrangian submanifold in Y prime. Because somehow in BV formalism, your field content is doubled in some sense. So you should only integrate over a Lagrangian there. And that is the construction. So, uh, and it depends parametrically on a point here and a point here. So your partition function will depend on a point here and a point here. And will depend on this kind of data of all these splittings and the choice of Lagrangian. That's a very rough, very rough picture of quantization. And it was made precise, for instance, uh, in the setup of a, of a particular class of AKSZ sigma models um, in terms of configuration space integrals where you don't have to, to say such vague and mathematically ill-defined things, but rather phrase everything in terms of Configuration space integrals and uh, your things like quantum mass equation, uh, they actually hold mathematically due to uh, Stokes theorem for configuration space integrals. But the story I'm telling now is a bit different. There are no configuration space integrals here. Everything is more simple. So a toy example is a 1D abelian chern simons um, So here the space of fields are uh, differential forms on an interval with coefficients in uh, some vector space equipped with an inner product. And let me put some parity shift here. So the fields are non-homogeneous differential forms. 
So there's a zero form component and one form component. They're all value, valued in this coefficient space. And um, the zero form component is odd. And the one form component is even. So instead of ghost numbers, I have Z2 grading uh, in the grading going on. So the action is just, uh, well, you can recognize here the action of the abelian chern simons theory on an interval. So A curly is this kind of super field here. Uh, so there is uh, the BV2 form and it's just, uh, and just this one that, that pairs the two components of the super field. So on the boundary, I have the uh, kind of, the, I, it's a theory on an interval, it has two boundary points. Let's say on a, one of the boundary points, the phase space would be just my uh, coefficient space well with a parity shift, so purely odd space. Um, with a symplectic structure, which is the uh, drum differential of this one form. And uh, the BFV action is just zero. And for, for quantization, I need to pick an additional structure for polarization. I need to pick a Lagrangian splitting uh, of my coefficient space. It can be either over real numbers or over complex numbers. I can do either. So, uh, well, doesn't matter here. So, but should be splitting into Lagrangian subspaces. And let's say that I fix, uh, so this induces a splitting of the fields into plus part and minus part. So let's say that uh, at the initial time, I fix the plus component of, field, of fields and the final time I fix the plus component of fields. Then, okay, so this is the base of my kind of vibration of fields over uh, boundary conditions. And the, this universal fiber I was talking about, uh, this is essentially the fiber over, if I put zeros, uh, zero boundary condition. And that's the differential forms uh, relative on the interval relative to the boundary, relative to the both boundary and endpoints with coefficients in H plus, plus um, differential forms, again, zero and one forms, both zero and one forms with coefficients in H minus. So this is a uh, complex um, which for which I need to consider the, its Hodge decomposition. So it has cohomology. So this, the cohomology is what I called residual fields before. So there's a cohomology coming from uh, the plus part and the cohomology coming from the minus part. And the cohomology coming from the plus part is essentially proportional to the uh, cohomology of the interval relative to the boundary points. So it's proportional to DT, it's concentrated in the RAM degree one. And cohomology for the minus part is the absolute cohomology of the interval. So it's concentra concentrated in, in the RAM degree zero. It's proportional to one. Um, and then the rest is an acyclic subcomplex, uh, which, uh, well, I can split according to the Hodge decomposition into the D exact part and the co exact part. So this is the D exact part. This is the co exact part. So, and the co exact, I, I called here K exact and it's called K exact because I actually, I want a particular operator K which kind of shoots from the inverse D. So, so there's a D going, going here and I want K which inverts the D. And I can write this K explicitly. So I want to write K because I like uh, perturbative path integrals and then I need, uh, I need the propagator and K is precisely the propagator. So uh, K is an integral operator like that. And I actually, I can write explicitly its integral kernel and it's something very simple. It has like a jump at, at some place. Uh, it's on configuration space of two points on an interval. So it has a jump on the diagonal. Uh, so uh, eta is the name for the integral kernel and it's uh, usually called a propagator. So, in the end of the day, my superfield uh, has, well, by now it has many pieces, right? So I'm sorry for that. But uh, well, there's one piece, which is the um, boundary fields, kind of extension of the, of, of, of the boundary fields. Uh, and for the extensions, I, I kind of imagine them to be uh, coming with a kind of extended into the bulk, but so that they have 
support concentrated near the boundary. Actually, I need to take a limit, uh, to take a, a limit of, such, of such an extension. I don't want into kind of technical details here, but somehow this particular extension is needed for the formalism to go through. Then, uh, so that's the, this twiddles, uh, they mean this extension. <clears throat> then there's the part corresponding to the, uh, my residual fields. And then there's the part corresponding to uh, the, the rest, kind of the fast fields or the fluctuations that I'm supposed to integrate over. But remember that I, I was supposed to integrate over the Lagrangian inside the, those fast fields. And uh, the Lagrangian is, yeah, I should tell you what is the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian is one of the halves of this Hodge splitting of, of into D exact and co and well coexact. Namely, the Lagrangian is the coexact part, and it's precisely the zero forms, the zero form part, and setting the one form part to zero. So I precisely set the one form part of the fluctuation to zero. So having said all these words and having written all these formulas, it's actually an extremely easy computation and made even easier by not writing it down explicitly. Uh, so, uh, well, the partition function uh, in the end of the day is just well a function of the initial and boundary uh, values of, of initial and, bound and final boundary conditions and the residual fields. And it's a Gaussian integral, or you can compute it in terms of some very easy Feynman diagrams. And that's the answer. It's an exponential of blah, and here's the blah. And uh, this blah looks, first of all, it looks very much like a formula that I have written before, several slides before, which was uh, the Hamilton Jacobi, generalized Hamilton Jacobi action for PDQ theory for QQ boundary conditions. And this is no surprise because uh, it's more or less a parity shift uh, of the PDQ theory, what we have here but somehow treated on a quantum level. Uh, so the statements here are that, well, it is a generalized generating function for the evolution relation, and it does satisfy the, um, all the conditions of a quantum BVBFE theory, in particular the master equation, uh, although here it's quite trivial, the master equation. You can also do uh, other choices of polarization, for instance, uh, Psi minus to Psi plus polarization, that's actually very easy. In, in this case, this fiber Y is just acyclic and we can choose the uh, space of residual fields to be just zero. And then the answer is very, very simple. We can also choose it to be non-zero and to be some other deformation retract of, uh, of Y. Then the answer is something more interesting, but well, uh, well, I didn't write it down for you. Uh, actually, yeah, the answer will be more, more interesting if you, if you leave something out and consider some interesting deformation retract. So here's another uh, modification of the 1D example that I will need. Namely, let's put uh, as a target of my 1D churn Simons. So I'm saying target because I'm kind of used to thinking of churn Simons in terms of AKZ construction, which tells us that churn Simons is actually a sigma model with the target being uh, the parity shift of a Lie algebra. So here I want to consider one Dichern Simons uh, with the target being a complex, uh, a complex uh, spread across degrees from zero to two K with K some odd integer with a differential and a pairing, pairing of degree negative two K so that they are compatible, this differential and the pairing. So this is a model, such a complex is a model for a differential forms on a closed two K dimensional manifold. So then the target of my churn Simons will be just uh, this complex shifted down by K units in degree so that uh, uh, in degree zero, I will have the middle of this complex. So the HK will, will, will be uh, in degree zero after the shift. So, and um, after the shift, I will have, I, I call it X and uh, kind of the middle has coordinates with ghost number zero. Uh, the term that's to the right with HK plus one has coordinates of degree minus one. So therefore I call it X minus one. The coordinates, uh, sorry, the term to the left of it, HK minus one has coordinates of degree plus one. Therefore it's called X one and so on. And also I need to, to polarize the middle part into uh, two Lagrangian pieces, X plus and X minus. 
Then, uh, okay. Um, I, again, I consider, so that's the datum for quantization, the, the polarization. So then again, I'm considering differential forms uh, on the interval with coefficients in X. So that's my uh, space of fields and everything proceeds as before. So I have a super field here, which is a non-homogeneous differential form. So the action is again, ADA, but A, well, A is a super field, but D now, so it's ADA, half ADA. But, uh, okay, combined with the wedge product, but D now is the sum of D on the interval plus D of the complex. So it has both parts. So, uh, okay. Now, uh, I want to consider this theory on an interval with a polarization where on the left side, the base is given by the minus component at the, in the ghost number zero part and sort of everything to the left of it, uh, which are things with a positive ghost number. This is positive ghost number part of the target. And uh, at, the, uh, at the out, endpoint of the interval. Uh, my polarization is given by psi plus, uh, so the plus component, and again, and also the same uh, the same components to the sitting to the to the uh, to the left mm, to the left of this decomposition. So with positive ghost number part. So this is a choice which turns out to be uh, kind of interesting for for doing Chern Simons. So um, here, my space, uh, I repeat the story. I calculate the uh, corresponding version of relative cohomology. So it's uh, kind of, it's again, a combination of uh, relative and absolute cohomology of the interval it times the corresponding components of, um, of the um, target. And in particular, the degree zero component of the residual fields is um, uh, the, well, re relative uh, cohomology of the interval relative to both endpoints, so dt, uh, span of dt, um, times the uh, kind of uh, the component of, uh, of x uh, corresponding to ghost number plus one. So after this multiplication, it gives me a field of, of, of degree zero. So, um, then I, I do the calculation of the effective action. So this is a perturbative path integral. It's very simple computation. Again, it's a Gaussian one and it gives me this answer. So, and here I can, uh, so there's a part which uh, involves only fields of degree zero in the first line and some uh, parts which involve other fields of other degrees. So so-called ghost part. And uh, here we can recognize uh, maybe uh, something that looks like uh, this del sigma, del, del bar sigma, del sigma structure that we have seen before when discussing a three dimensional Chern Simons classically. And in fact, it is that structure. So let me transition to that. So if I specialize to uh, 3D Chern Simons, which I can think of as one dimensional Chern Simons with a huge target, it's an example of a previous example, but with an enormous target. with the target being the complex of differential forms on the surface and with its middle degree split like that. Then just repeating what I just did, I recover, uh, I recover the effective action for the abelian churn simons uh, which, is, which is this one, uh, which depends on the boundary uh, fields and boundary ghost, ghosts uh, and uh, also on the residual fields, which are um, sigma uh, and uh, well, which are okay, two fields which, which have certain genesis uh, from the previous construction. Uh, well, they, they are, they come from this uh, relative and absolute cohomology construction. But here, if, if I just forget how they, how, what is their genesis, then sigma is just a zero form on, on a surface. And uh, I have a second residual field, which is, uh, has internal degree negative one, and it's a two form on the surface. So this one. And uh, well, it's notation is well, some notation which has some motivation for it. So star is a notation for an anti-field for 
A. So, and then one can transition to the maybe more interesting non-abelian case. So in the non-abelian case, uh, one deforms what we had before by an interaction term, which is the essentially a cube of, uh, well, a cube of A. So now uh, my field is a differential form with coefficients in a fixed Lie algebra. So, uh, so th this is uh, the action of the, of the, this is a battalion Wilkowski action of uh, non abelian Chern Simons theory. So, uh, A curly is a super field of Chern Simons. So, it combines the classical field, the ghost, the anti field, the anti ghost, or uh, more mathematically speaking, it's a non homogeneous differential form on a three manifold where uh, with values in the Lie algebra where different degrees are prescribed, different Durham components are prescribed, different internal gradings. And then uh, when I repeat the calculation, there will be many more uh, kind of uh, diagrams to calculate if, when calculating the perturbative path integral, well, because of this new interaction term, but still it is a, a manageable computation, essentially because of the gauge fixing that we are using here, because it's essentially what, what would be called the axial, axial gauge fixing. And uh, it's, it actually makes the computation, it's a, a nice exercise to do. And that, so here's the picture of all the diagrams that, that, that you get there. Um, and this is what you get in the end of the day. So, and different terms here, they correspond to different classes of, of diagrams. So uh, there are maybe two interesting terms to focus on here. One is this term, which uh, in a moment will become the WZW action. And well, there is also this term, which is interesting. It's interesting because it's ill-defined and it is the one loop correction. It is, uh, it is defined only after certain regularization. And the, well, it's ill-defined because the XL gauge is, well, it has some deficiency and some things become singular, the XL gauge. In particular, this uh, contribution of uh, wheel diagrams. But also, uh, also the expression here, it looks like a h bar times sum over the points of the surface, which is of course something nonsensical, uh, but becomes sen sensible if you replace a surface with a cell complex, for instance, that would be a regularization. That would, then it will be a sum over the vertices of that cell complex. But also the expression appearing here, uh, it should look suggestive because if I denote it j, then you might have seen this expression in just in Lie theory. So if you take the pullback of the Haar measure on the group, by the exponential map, then it, it is, and compare it to the Lebesgue measure on the Lie algebra, then they're not the same, but they differ by certain function on the Lie algebra. And that function is the exponential of what we see here. So, and uh, in fact, what I wrote here is already the result of resumming all the diagrams, but individually when you compute it, then you see a lot of Bernoulli numbers, when, which you can kind of see from here, here, and here, there's a lot of Bernoulli numbers popping up. So then um, a nice thing to do is to um, change the parameterization for the residual fields to a group valued parameterization. So instead of that uh, Lie algebra valued fields uh, little sigma to consider a group valued field exponential of sigma. And it's sort of Darbu counterpart. So that together they form a Darbu pair for the BV2 form. Well, it has some rather complicated expression, but it's uh, some linear transformation of the Darbu counterpart of the original uh, linear residual field sigma. So, um, and then if I transform my original uh, effective action into this new parameterization for residual fields, this group parameterization, then I obtain a much nicer expression, uh, which is, well, first of all, when I say transform, I should say transform not as a function, but as a something called logarithmic half density. So that, well, this equality holds so that they don't uh, compare as a function, but sort of I should uh, take into account the Jacobian of the transformation from one set of variables to the other set of variables. And when I do that, then actually this uh, singular ill-defined part disappears, uh, essentially because of what I told here. It disappears essentially because of that. And, uh, and what I see here is the WZW action, uh, 
of, uh, of my group valued residual fields interacting with the two boundary fields and some ghost corrections to that. And the properties of uh, this answer, so you can say that this is uh, some particular point of view on chern simons to WZW correspondence, so what we got here. So the properties here are that, well, first of all, there are no quantum corrections. There could be conceivably quantum corrections, but in these group parameterizations, there are no quantum corrections in this computation. So um, second property is that if I um, truncate um, so if I take just the first line here, so if I throw away everything depending on the ghosts, if I take only the first line, then it is the generalized generating function for the evolution Lagrangian uh, corresponding to classical chern simons theory. So there is no uh, usual hamilton jacobi action, but this is the generalized hamilton jacobi action that you get. And also you have the quantum master equation or in some, in some regularized sense. So it's quantum part holds in some regularized sense. Again, you would need to replace the surface with a cell complex to make sense of it. Uh, the classical part uh, holds without any caveat, uh, but uh, so the operators appearing here, so delta is something straightforward. Well, it's still, okay, almost straightforward. Oops, uh, it's randomly switches to the eraser. And omega is also relatively straightforward. It's uh, um, just uh, the canonical quantization in this case of the um, uh, of the BFV action on the boundary. So uh, you can also do the um, redo this exercise for a different choice of boundary polarizations. For instance, to do to take holomorphic and holomorphic polarization on both sides, and take ghost in uh, ghost to the inside, ghost to the outside. Then there will be more residual fields in the game. And uh, well, this is uh, an exercise that that's, that one can do. And it's also something related to the uh, WZW uh, action, but well, depending on this larger package of uh, residual fields. Maybe just uh, uh, as a final thing to say, and here I don't want to say much, um, partly, partly because I, I have to confess, I don't understand this example well enough. So, uh, but uh, it was, it, it deserves to be mentioned because it was a motivating one. So, uh, so one can consider seven dimensional abelian chern simons theory on a cylinder. So, um, so a theory which is classically just uh, the integral over some, uh, I don't know, seven dimensional manifold N, uh, one half ADA, where A is a three form. So, and put it on a, so yeah, this is very much uh, kind of um, inspired by this paper by Gerasimov and Shatashvili. So uh, put on this um, cylinder, uh, an interval cross a Calabi-Yau manifold of complex dimension three, so that the, the total thing has a real dimension seven. Well, so far it might be not, not clear <clears throat> why these choices of, of dimensions, very particular ones, <clears throat> and uh, additional structures. Um, but, um, okay, so for polarization, so you can think of it as this 1D chern simons with values in a complex, where the complex is differential forms on the calabi -Yau. So differential forms in the calabi are bigraded, which I want to, to use for the choice of polarization. For the, the choice of polarization on the, it will be very different on the in and out sides. So on the inside, it is given by sort of everything below the blue line. So for instance, this part is the uh, kind of the physical part, the ghost number zero part. This is, uh, this diagonal is the ghost number one part. This diagonal is ghost number two. This is ghost number three. That's the inside. So this, this is very similar to what we had before, uh, essentially the linear holomorphic polarization. On the outside, we have a, um, a, something more interesting and non-linear polarization or rather uh, we have kind of linear polarization in the non-trivial ghost number, we, which we again take this triangle. So, uh, so this diagonal, this diagonal, and this diagonal. But for the physical part, instead of taking this part or this part, we take something called Hitchens polarization. Uh, so, and here's, here one uses the kind of calabi yau structure. So um, three forms 
on a calabial, they can be, uh, one can consider the splitting into uh, forms a plus plus a minus, where um, a plus and a minus are fully decomposable into one forms, decomposable as which products of one forms. So almost every, except for a measure zero subset uh, in omega three can be decomposed this way. And you can parameterize this uh, plus and minus components in a nice way. So here, omega zero is a uh, Calabio holomorphic volume form, and the bar is the its conjugate counterpart. So rho is some function, and um, rho bar is also some function, and mu is a, a zero one form with coefficients in a one zero vector fields. So you can parameterize a, a plus objects by the pairs rho and mu. And this notation means that uh, means that I take rho times omega zero plus rho contraction of mu with omega zero plus rho contraction with mu contraction with mu over two omega zero plus rho contraction with mu contraction with mu contraction with mu divided by six omega zero. And then you stop because you run out of degrees. So plus and so on. Uh, so, okay, then the, mm, okay, so that's the parameterization and uh, uh, the polarization is that in the base, we take this uh, A minus part. So then you can again calculate the effective action, but this actually requires an extension of the setup, which is something that we did. And that was a uh, kind of a, a part of the activity also in the one dimensional examples. And then you sort of um, develop it from one dimensional examples to include the story of nonlinear polarization and what to do with the nonlinear polarization. So, <clears throat> and in the end of the day, um, so you need to do some, I don't know, some clever changes of uh, variables to deal with nonlinear polarizations. And in the end of the day, this is what, what, what we got. So it is set an explicit answer. Also, surprisingly, without quantum corrections, but this actually hinges on, on some particular properties of this polarization. Where G, this uh, capital G, is a certain explicit well, complicated function uh, that is a generating function for the transformation from the linear to the nonlinear polarization. So it is possible to calculate this uh, action and it, it again has the same properties uh, as before. So it is uh, satisfies the quantum mass equation and uh, generates, uh, generates the, the Lagrangian relation, evolution relation. But here we are kind of using some special properties of the, uh, of the polarization. And finally, uh, this is related to this um, Codera Spencer or BCOV theory, just a very brief mention that to see this relation, what we do, uh, and this is again a rephrasing of, of what uh, was conceived in, um, uh, in uh, Gerasimov and Shetashvili, uh, we should uh, pair, we should glue the cylinder or uh, pair, pair it to some uh, state that sits, oops, um, that uh, sits at the outgoing boundary, the one which carries the nonlinear polarization. This is some rather simple state, so written simply in this nonlinear polarization. Then you do some integration of the over the residual fields, and you recover uh, you recover uh, the path integral of the Kodeira Spencer theory, which okay, the Lagrangian that sits there uh, is the uh, is related to the deformation theory of complex structures. So I don't want to say anything more about it here. So I should stop. Uh, so I'm sorry for taking um, uh, yeah, too much of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, maybe I could ask one question, um, mm -hmm. which had to do with my motivation uh, in some sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Can this kind of theory that you are describing now also be developed for a simplicial complex? So um, this uh, this is something that uh, that I don't know. So I, I very much like cutting things into tiny chunks, uh, yeah. and but this we didn't do here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know. Uh, so cutting things into tiny chunks is related to finding clever gauge fixings. Right, I see. Uh, on, on tiny chunks. And I know uh, 
some ways to find clever gauge fixings. So um, uh, one one very nice gauge fixing that I, that I like is called uh, Dupont's chain homotopy for simplicial complexes, mm -hmm. which I don't know how to use here. Maybe it can be used somehow, but I I, I don't know. Uh, the other uh, gauge fixing that we do use, but not in that way, but I know uh, in, in, in some other way, I know how to, how to use it, uh, how to cut things into triangles and things like that is, you can use Excel gauge fixing actually to uh, cut, for instance, two dimensional young mills into, into, um, into, I don't know, uh, squares, triangles and things like that. If you, for instance, square clearly carries a, an Excel gauge fixing, but then if you allow yourself to degenerate a side, then you can get a triangle. Mm -hmm. So actually one can play this game. Uh, but here, the, the short answer would be, I don't know. I see. No, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? If not, yeah, uh, thank Pavel again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. <laughs> mm -hmm.